What's up guys, welcome to chapter 2 of my rewrite series for the Transformers Saga. I know you guys have been asking for this one for a while now, and I apologize for it taking so long to come out, but I had to spend a lot of time completely rearranging the story and coming up with a plot that would be cohesive with the rest of my rewrite series, since despite all of my efforts, I couldn't find any theme or moral message that the original Transformers 2 was trying to convey. There just wasn't anything there that was deeper than explosive action scenes. So, I had to come up with a theme that tied in with the rest of the series' ethics and build a completely new plot from the ground up around that theme. And that theme is Faith in Leadership. I'll touch more on that as we move on with these videos. Also, because of this extensive rewrite, I had to separate my rewrite on Transformers 2 into four parts, with each video covering one act of the film. So, this will be part one, and I'll be following up with parts two, three, and four in more videos. Now, if you haven't seen my rewrite for the first Transformers movie, I highly recommend you check that out first before you watch this video. The link is in the description below. But if you're busy and you don't have time for that, here's a quick recap of the first Transformers rewrite. If you're all caught up, you can go ahead and skip to this time in the video. Now, let's get started. In the first Transformers film, we're introduced to Spike Witwicky, a mechanically inclined high school kid who lives with his widowed father, Irving Witwicky who's nicknamed Sparkplug after the name of his automotive business. As a reward for his good grades, Sparkplug buys Spike a used 1984 Volkswagen Beetle. Much to the Witwicky surprise, the Beetle turns out to be a mute Autobot named Bumblebee. Bumblebee is on Earth searching for the Allspark, an all-powerful artifact that crash-landed on Earth generations ago. Both the Autobots and the Decepticons want to recover the Allspark to restore their home world of Cybertron, which was rendered lifeless during their civil war. But the Autobots want to bring life back to Cybertron through peaceful means, while the Decepticons intend to burn everything in their path to repair the planet that they themselves are responsible for destroying. The only lead that Bumblebee has to finding the Allspark rests with the Witwickies. One of their ancestors, an explorer named Archibald Witwicky, accidentally imprinted the coordinates to the Allspark on his glasses. The Witwickies agree to help Bumblebee, and he summons reinforcements to Earth. Five more Autobots answer the call, Ratchet, Ironhide, Jazz, and the legendary leader of the Autobots, Optimus Prime. The Autobots successfully recover the glasses, but at the cost of the Witwickies and Bumblebee being arrested by a secret government agency known as Sector 7. To the surprise of our heroes, it is revealed that Sector 7 is in possession of the Allspark, along with the Decepticon's leader, Megatron. After Bumblebee uses the Allspark to repair his voice box, the heroes come up with a plan to launch the Allspark back into space with the Autobots thereby sparing Earth the possibility of being caught in the crossfire of an intergalactic war. On the way to the launch site, the Decepticons, led by their second-in-command Starscream, attack the Autobots and Sector 7. Megatron breaks free from his prison and joins the battle, killing Jazz and mortally wounding Optimus, Bumblebee, and Spike. But before Megatron can claim the Allspark, Optimus uses the Relic to critically damage Megatron, forcing him to retreat with Starscream and Soundwave, the only surviving Decepticons. Megatron, Starscream, and Soundwave flee to space and regroup aboard a spaceship known as the Nemesis. The captain of the Nemesis is Megatron's master, an ancient Decepticon known as the Fallen. Despite their setback, Megatron reveals to the Fallen that before the war on Cybertron ended, he came up with a contingency plan to rebuild Cybertron in case the Decepticons couldn't retrieve the Allspark. Meanwhile, the Autobots' presence on Earth is exposed to the public, and after hosting a funeral for Jazz, Optimus meets with all of Earth's leaders who agreed to provide the Autobots with safe haven on their planet in exchange for protection against the Decepticons. A new organization, known as NEST, is formed to coordinate with the Autobots and work with them as they find a new way to return home to Cybertron. Now, I did away with the subtitles for my rewrites because none of the original subtitles, like Revenge of the Fallen or Dark of the Moon, seemed to hold that much significance to the rewrites I came up with. So, I decided to take the Iron Man approach, and this rewrite will only be called Transformers 2, no subtitle. As far as the plot goes, the original Transformers 2 seemed to take some inspiration from the G1 episode, Changing Gears, where the Decepticons built a device to absorb the power of the Earth's sun. So, I went ahead and took the liberty of using a couple G1 episodes as inspirations for this rewrite. Those episodes will include Divide and Conquer, Fire in the Sky, and Fire on the Mountain. Act 1 Much like the first Transformers movie, we open with a prologue narrated by Optimus. He details that before the Civil War, his people were led by 13 Primes, with Optimus himself being the 13th and last Prime. At one point, Cybertron was facing an energy crisis, 
There were too many citizens and not enough energon to go around. So, the Primes constructed devices called the Star Harvesters to siphon the suns and stars and other solar systems and convert their power into energon. But the Primes had one rule. It was forbidden for star destroyers to be built on planets inhabited with life, lest the Cybertronians commit genocide in their quest for resources. And for a time, all was well. The energy crisis was solved, and Cybertron continued to enjoy a reign of peace. That was until the proudest of the Primes, a black-hearted manipulator by the name of Liege Maximo, began secretly building star harvesters on planets populated with sentient life. The planet of Torculon and its people were one of the many victims claimed by Liege Maximo's selfish ambitions. Once the other Primes learned of this treachery and confronted their brother about it, Liege Maximo defended himself by saying that the life forms consumed by his star harvesters were worthy sacrifices for the greater glory of Cybertron. The short but bloody conflict that soon followed was known as the Prime War, and it ended with 10 of the Primes either being killed or missing in action. As a result, only Optimus Prime, Sentinel Prime, and Liege Maximo were left. The Prime of Lies was defeated, and he was forced into exile, his rank and title being stripped from him, and he was branded as the Fallen forced to roam the stars as an outcast, while Cybertron thrived under the rule of Sentinel Prime. Present day, the Nemesis. Megatron is strapped to a table, lying there unconscious while a team of Decepticon medics are finishing up repairs on their leader. Extensive internal and external damage was dealt to Megatron when he was almost consumed by the Allspark, and they had to put him in stasis for months while they operated on him. Once he's fully functional and back online, Megatron leaves for the bridge, encountering Decepticon crew members along the way. Soundwave approaches Megatron and respectfully genuflects towards him. Welcome back, Lord Megatron. Ah, Soundwave, are the preparations in order? As you commanded, splendid. Come, it's time to enlighten our esteemed master. At the bridge, Starscream is bringing forward a group of Decepticon flyers known as the Seekers before the Fallen to pledge fealty to him. Amongst these Seekers are the twins Skywarp and Thundercracker, and two other flyers named Ramjet and Firestorm. Starscream explains to the Fallen that he came across this last batch of recruits while patrolling the planet Neptune, and has welcomed them back to swear their allegiance to the Fallen's excellence once again. Megatron enters the bridge, and Starscream quickly rushes up and kneels. Lord Megatron, I was so relieved to hear of your awakening. Spare me your pathetic groveling, Starscream. Starscream casts Megatron a scowl once his back is turned. The Fallen welcomes his disciple back to the fold, and informs him that while he was in surgery, Starscream had been scouting the stars, looking for any Decepticon stragglers and recruiting them to bolster their numbers. Along with the Seekers, Starscream has also successfully recruited the Constructicons, who have been a valuable asset to their cause. With Soundwave's help, Megatron presents his contingency plan to restore Cybertron. In the final days of the war, Megatron had battalions of Decepticons dispatched to multiple solar systems where he believed the Allspark would most likely be found. One of those battalions lies in waiting on Earth's moon, and if that army were to be reactivated, they could be used to conquer Earth and turn the human race into a slave labor force, whose only purpose in life would be to rebuild Cybertron. This is Megatron's plan B for restoring their homeworld. But, Megatron's plans were set back when he was imprisoned by Sector 7 for 110 years, and Megatron's fleet on the moon had run out of power and gone into stasis while waiting for their commander to return. In order to revive them, the Decepticons will need a large amount of energon, which they don't have. The Fallen reveals that there is an incomplete Star Harvester on Earth, and its construction had been disrupted thanks to the interference of the other Primes. If they could somehow find that Star Harvester and finish it, they could siphon enough of the Sun's power to reactivate the Decepticon fleet without entirely destroying the planet, thereby allowing them to enslave the humans and force them to resurrect Cybertron. The only problem is that it's been thousands of years since the Fallen's last visit to Earth, and the planet's landscape has drastically changed since then. The Fallen admits that he doesn't recall the Star Harvester's exact location, prompting Soundwave to begin searching for it. Meanwhile, on Earth, Spike is graduating high school and Bumblebee covertly attends the ceremony with Epps and Donnelly. The two Nest agents smuggle Bee into Spike's graduation party at the Witwicky house, and the attendees are astounded at getting the chance to meet a real Autobot. At the behest of some of the partygoers, Bee performs some tricks with his transforming abilities and takes photographs with Spike's ecstatic friends. Throughout the party, Sparkplug makes a few comments about Spike attending college, which frustrates Spike, and when he tries to protest against going to college, Sparkplug cuts him off by introducing Spike to some distant family relatives. Once the party is over and the rest of Spike's family and friends have left, 
Spark plug, Epps, and Donnelly sit back and drink a couple of beers while watching TV and catching up with one another. From Spark Plugs TV, they watch the local news reporting of Optimus Prime meeting with the Pope to discuss alien ethics and religion. Epps remarks on how skilled of a diplomat Optimus is, since he's done nothing but create good relations with every major authority figure he's met with on Earth. As the public face and spokesperson of the Autobots, Optimus has done nothing but create a good reputation for his followers and for Nest. Sparkplug shares with the Nest agents that he really wants Spike to do something with his life and go to college, but his son is fighting him every step of the way. He wants to be just like his dad, but Sparkplug thinks that Spike has so much more potential than just being a simple mechanic. Meanwhile, Spike and Bumblebee sneak off to go joyriding. They drive all the way to the shoreline, where Bee and Spike watch the sunset together. Spike vents to Bumblebee how irritating his dad is being, forcing him to go to college when school just isn't cut out for him. Spike's never been good with exams or with studying. He's never been book smart. His talents lie with his hands. He loves working on machines. That's what he's good at. That's what gets his blood pumping. And he wants his career to be involved with something in that field. Spike feels at the very least, Ness should allow him to work for them as a mechanic. That's the least they can do to repay Spike for helping save the world. This gives Bumblebee an idea. Back aboard the Nemesis, Soundwave has tracked faint traces of Cybertronian protomatter in the Arctic that could potentially be the Star Harvester. Starscream volunteers to lead the Constructicons in excavating the device, but due to his untrustworthiness, Megatron assigns Soundwave to accompany Starscream. The Decepticons take a shuttle down to the Arctic, and the Constructicons get to work digging through the ice. But instead of finding the Star Harvester, the Constructicons uncover a massive 50-foot tall Cybertronian frozen in ice. Starscream is speechless. He recognizes the frozen titan and commands the Constructicons to immediately haul him back to the Nemesis. When the Constructicons accidentally slip on the ice and drop the frozen Cybertronian, Starscream viciously orders them to be careful and threatens to throw them in the smelting pool if any harm comes to the unknown giant. Soundwave asks Starscream why he cares so much about this mystery bot, and Starscream divulges that the deactivated Cybertronian is an old friend and colleague of his named Jetfire. Before the war on Cybertron, Starscream and Jetfire had been partners in science and archaeology. They had been charting Earth to study the Prime War, but before they even got a chance to analyze the battle sites, a brutal storm swept in and separated the two. Jetfire was lost, and Starscream spent days searching in vain. He eventually gave up and returned to Cybertron, believing his comrade to be dead. The Decepticon medics thaw out Jetfire and bring him back online, and Starscream welcomes his old friend back. It takes a few moments for Jetfire to get his bearings, and Starscream updates him on everything that has transpired since Jetfire's disappearance. Naturally, Starscream spins lies about the Autobots, blaming the war for Cybertron on them and painting the Decepticons in a pretty picture. Jetfire is greatly heartbroken to hear of Cybertron's dormancy, and it's clear that this huge and intimidating Cybertronian is really just a big softy. Despite his frightening size, Jetfire has the heart of a gentle scientist and literally wouldn't hurt a fly. Starscream asks his old partner if he'll team up with him once again and join the Decepticon cause of restoring Cybertron. Jetfire shows doubts about serving the Decepticons as a warrior instead of a scientist, but joins anyway out of a sense of loyalty to his best friend. At Starscream's urging, Jetfire is named a Seeker. The Decepticons engrave their insignia on Jetfire's chest, change the color of his optics from blue to red, and arm him with a missile launcher, which Jetfire admits makes him feel pretty uncomfortable. Soundwave tracks down another potential Star Harvester site, this time in Peru, and dispatches the Seekers to investigate. The Seekers descend on the pyramids of Peru, scaring off a bus full of tourists. They start blasting at the pyramids. They're in luck. The stones crumble to reveal the half-built Star Harvester. Megatron mobilizes the Decepticons, and immediately sends the Constructicons to retrieve the rest of the materials they need to finish the Star Harvester. Back in Massachusetts, Spike is walking out the front door, dressed for his new job. Sparkplug reluctantly sees him off, wishing once again that Spike had listened to him and enrolled in college. Spike rolls his eyes and states that Bumblebee did him a favor reaching out to Linux and getting him a job at the local Energon refinery. It isn't much now, but eventually he plans on working his way up. We cut to a montage of Spike learning the ropes at the refinery, making new friends with his co-workers and voluntarily picking up shifts for people who call in sick. He's fitting in really well at this new job, and he seems to be happy. He's in his comfort zone. This will be an homage to the G1 animated Transformers series, where both Spike and his dad worked at an oil refinery before meeting the Autobots in the pilot episode. One day, visitors arrive at the refinery. It's Bill Chase, who mostly goes by his nickname, Chip. Some of you will recognize Chip as one of the Autobots' most stalwart human allies from back in the G1 show. 
where he uses genius level IQ to help tip the scales in the Autobot Decepticon War. In this version, I imagine Chip being played by Dave Franco, since he not only has a youthful and clever persona about him, but he's also a year older than Shia LaBeouf, and that works out perfectly since Spike and Chip are around the same age in the original 80s cartoon. I know in the original show, Chip was born paralyzed and confined to a wheelchair, and we'll get to that eventually in this rewrite series, but for now, he's perfectly healthy and walking on both legs. He also works for Ness as the head of their science department, being accredited with multiple degrees in chemistry, engineering, robotics, and computer science, despite being in his early 20s. He's something of a young Bruce Banner in this rewrite, having graduated from high school at the age of 14 and being hired by Ness at the age of 20. Chip arrives at the Energon refinery riding inside of Optimus Prime. Chip is inspecting the refinery because the administrators hope he can come up with new methods to improve their production rates. Optimus volunteered to escort Chip since he felt it would be a good opportunity to check up on the weapons the refineries are building to help combat the Decepticons. Spike is overjoyed to see his old friend, and the foreman is about to command Spike to get back to work until Optimus cuts him off by stepping in front of the foreman and kneeling down before Spike to greet him. Optimus takes the opportunity to introduce Chip to Spike. Chip recognizes Spike from when he was first interviewed by the news stations back when the Autobots were first exposed to the public. Chip compliments Spike's heroism and asks Spike, as a grunt who works on the front lines of the refinery, what he thinks they could be doing to boost their production scale. Spike is about to give his suggestions when several explosions suddenly go off around the refinery. Jetfire and the Constructicons drop down from the sky and begin stealing the raw energon that the refinery workers are collecting with glowing metal containers. These containers will be an homage to the energon cube seen in G1. Jetfire's curiosity is piqued at the sight of the humans, and he becomes instantly enthralled by the tiny organic creatures, completely distracting him from the mission. Scrapper, the leader of the Constructicons, sees Jetfire hovering curiously over a group of terrified workers, and orders him to focus on their objective. Jetfire, disappointed at having his scientific discovery interrupted, complies and transforms into his alt mode, a massive Cybertronian jet. Chip sends out a distress call to the nearest military base as the Constructicons begin loading Energon crates into Jetfire. Optimus drives up to the intruders and draws his axe, giving the Decepticons one chance to give up the Energon and leave peacefully. The Constructicons laugh as they swarm the outnumbered Optimus, and we get the same badass fight that we had in Revenge of the Fallen where Optimus took on three Decepticons by himself and almost won. Except this time, Optimus will be facing off against six Decepticons at the same time and will fight just as impressively. Both sides are refraining from using firearms so that they don't blow themselves up with their refinery, offering this fight sequence to be filled with some brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat and close quarter melee fighting. Both Jetfire and the humans will watch on from the sidelines. They're both on the edge of their seats waiting to see how this battle will turn out. The fight seems to be at a draw, and Optimus isn't slowing down. If he keeps this up, he might just win. The Constructicons try to tip the scales by combining into Devastator, but Optimus is too fast and doesn't give the Decepticons a chance to combine. He expertly switches from his axe to a pair of Energon swords and then a pair of Energon hooks that he takes from the Constructicon, whose name is literally Hook, and uses the Decepticon's own weapons against him. It almost seems like Optimus is dancing around the Decepticons, using the fact that there's multiple enemies to his advantage. He tosses the Constructicons into each other and times his dodges perfectly so that they end up hitting each other instead of him, while simultaneously providing Optimus with openings to pummel them. He's got ages worth of skill and experience on his side, and even when the Constructicons manage to get a few hits in, those don't seem to do much to Prime. Eventually, Bone Crusher gets sick of Optimus wiping the floor with them, and he pulls out his blaster and aims at Prime. No, Bone Crusher, don't! Bone Crusher fires at Optimus, but misses, and hits a fuel tank instead. It explodes and causes a leak. Optimus realizes that one of the tanks next to the assembled refinery workers is about to explode. He disengages from the fight and dives in front of the workers, shielding them with his body. The blast tears through Prime, and he weakly struggles to lift himself up onto one knee while smoke trails off his burnt chassis. The Constructicons take advantage of Prime's weakened state, and they nail him with multiple shots. Prime's chest explodes, and he collapses, his optics barely flickering. Spike rushes over to Optimus' side, begging for Optimus to get back up. Tears start to form in his eyes when Optimus just lies still and doesn't respond to him. The military reinforcements that Chip summoned arrive, and just as the Constructicons prepare to meet this new challenge, Starscream orders them over intercom to gather the Energon and leave at once. The Constructicons reluctantly obey, taking off in a shuttle while Jetfire ferries the Energon back to the Nemesis. The choppers arrive to transport Optimus back to Nest HQ. When Spike tries to board one of the helicopters, the soldiers stop him. Chip notices how distraught Spike is over Optimus' condition, 
and gives him the clearance to accompany him back to the base. Nest's base of operations is located within the Susquehanna Valley of New York. It's a huge base with futuristic architecture that lies in the middle of the country fields, next to the river which supplies the base with power. This is where both the Autobots and Nest work with one another on a daily basis. The isolation of the river valley proves useful in accommodating the Autobot's size, as well as maintaining secrecy for Nest's operations. Chip explains to Spike that the base's name is officially called Metroplex, since that's the title the Autobots picked out for it, but the humans of Nest have taken to calling it Autobot City due to the large influx of Autobot immigrants that have been arriving on Earth. Once Optimus is dropped off, Ratchet immediately exits the base with Wheeljack, and together they gently carry Optimus off to the med bay. Chip reassures Spike that Optimus is in good hands before taking him inside Autobot City for a tour. Chip takes Spike into the garage, where they see Bumblebee helping out Nest agents with a training exercise by pretending to be a Decepticon. Burke is helping B out with the drill, and he greets Spike with a bro hug. B is relieved to see that Spike is alright and offers to be Spike's tour guide while Chip goes back to the science department to see if he can be of any assistance to Ratchet and Wheeljack. While Spike sits on his shoulder, Bumblebee walks around Autobot City and explains that a couple of months ago, one Autobot ship received Optimus' message and flew to Earth to answer his call. This second wave of Autobots arrived aboard the Exantium and she was carrying nine passengers. RC, Wheeljack, Mirage, Blur, the twins Sideswipe and Sunstreaker, and the Wreckers Leadfoot, Topspin, and Roadbuster, along with Leadfoot's pet Steeljaw. Since then, the original four Autobots have been spending their time familiarizing their companions with Earth laws and customs. B takes Spike to the training grounds, where the rest of the Autobots are blowing off steam and trying to keep their minds occupied so that they don't worry too much over Optimus' condition. I want Bumblebee in this rewrite to be something like a little brother to the rest of the Autobots. He was part of the last generation of Cybertronians to be built off the assembly line before the Cybertronian Civil War started, so he's regarded as something of a teenager by the rest of the older and more experienced Autobots. He's the Autobots equivalent of what the Flash is to the Justice League, in the sense that he serves as the team's morale booster and his optimism is the glue that keeps the team together. His laid back and warm hearted personality allow him to make friends with almost everyone he meets. So, when Bumblebee introduces Spike to each of his new teammates, He'll give them compliments on their training and offer tips on how they can improve their combat skills. Ironhide, as the weapon specialist, is overseeing a test run on a new automatic weapon system for Blur. Using holograms, Ironhide tests Blur's speed against imaginary foes in a training course outside the base. Spike gets to witness Blur's speed firsthand. I want to give Blur the wheel tires that Sideswipe had in the Bay films, just because I think that makes way more sense for Blur's character to have that design since he's a racer. As a bonus, I'd bring back John Moshita Jr. to voice Blur. He was the original voice actor back in the 80s, and let's face it, nobody can talk as fast as he can. To be or not to be, that is a question whether it is noble in the mind to suffer the things and I was a very just fortunate to come to get to see if troubles are by posing in them to die to sleep to sleep pretends a dream other. You get the idea. He still holds the record to this day as the world's fastest talking man. At the end of the weapons test, Blur critiques to Ironhide that the reload time on the guns could be faster, even though Ironhide had just broken a record on said reloading time with his newest modification. Ironhide grumbles that Blur needs to slow down a little bit before Blur introduces himself to Spike as the fastest racer on Cybertron and briskly describes how he had been a star athlete and celebrity before the war. Spike and Bumblebee laugh when Blur says that Ironhide is the grouchiest and most honorary trainer he's ever worked with. Ironhide instantly responds by aiming his cannons at all three of them. I don't think it's nice that you're laughing. You see, my cannons don't like people laughing. They get the crazy idea that people are laughing at them. Now if you apologize, like I know you're going to, I might convince them that you really didn't mean it. Blur nervously zips away, leaving Spike and B alone, but Spike just smiles. Been watching more Clint Eastwood, Ironhide? He really is an exceptional filmographer. It's filmmaker, Ironhide. They're called filmmakers. Oh. Ironhide retracts his cannons and introduces Spike to his long-lost teammates, the Wreckers. While he is happy to be reunited with his brothers in arms, Ironhide is upset that the Wreckers are not allowed off of Autobot City due to their behavior issues. This is reinforced when the boisterous Wreckers harass nearby nest agents and cause a huge ruckus for no other reason than because they can. They'll toss spare parts to the human mechanics and cuss at them, telling them how worthless they are and that they better watch their backs, only to roar with laughter when the mechanics run away in fear. Ironhide moves along the training course and introduces Spike to the twins Sideswipe and Sunstreaker right after they complete an aggressive sparring match. Spike asks Sideswipe and Sunstreaker why they look so much alike. We're brothers, says Sideswipe sarcastically. How? We're not related the same way you fleshes are related to each other. 
Sideswipe and I share two halves of the same spark. Whatever he feels, I feel. Whatever I think, he thinks. Yeah, right. You wouldn't be half as stupid if you had my brains. This leads to brotherly bickering that then escalates into a petty fist fight, causing Ironhide to shake his head and walk away with Spike and Bumblebee. Those two are something else entirely. The good thing is they spend just as much time fighting cons as they do fighting each other. For this rewrite, I decided to replace Skids and Mudflap with Sideswipe and Sunstreaker. Since I like the idea of expanding the Transformers lore by exploring the possibility of Cybertronian siblings. And the twins Sideswipe and Sunstreaker would still be kid appeal characters like Bumblebee through Comic Relief, but it wouldn't be as heavy handed or as vulgar as it was with Skids and Mudflap. Sideswipe and Sunstreaker are more like athletes and jocks than anything else, and the friendly sibling rivalry between Sideswipe and Sunstreaker in my rewrite is more like the dynamic between Fred and George Weasley in Harry Potter. The last batch of recruits that Ironhide and B introduce Spike to are RC and Mirage, who are training together. At first, it seems like RC is on a training field by herself, wearing a visor that covers her optics. She keenly follows the sound of the movement around her, tensely waiting for something to happen. RC suddenly reaches behind her and slams something invisible down onto the ground. Ironhide applauds RC, and Mirage suddenly appears beneath her foot, groaning in pain from the takedown she just delivered. Mirage explains to Spike that they've been testing one of Wheeljack's latest inventions, a cloaking device that allows the wearer to become invisible. Mirage elegantly bows before Spike, and speaks in a very formal and polite manner, displaying his origins as a wealthy socialite from Cybertron's high class. Spike becomes confused at the concept of female Cybertronians when he meets RC. She briefly explains that while there is no gender amongst Transformers, certain Cybertronians underwent mutations that make them appear physically similar to organic female beings. This happened when certain colonies on Cybertron became cut off from the rest of civilization during the war, and those isolated Cybertronians underwent a process the humans call allocated speciation. Said female Transformers had to adapt and become shorter and slimmer to survive their new environment, giving them a more feminine look. RC admits that her kind are rare, but she takes pride in that as it makes her all the more unique and unpredictable on the battlefield. While Ratchet and Wheeljack frantically operate on their unconscious leader inside the medbay, the camera zooms in into Optimus's empty eyes, and we transition to a mysterious and foggy dimension. Optimus realizes that he's in another plane of existence. Wherever he's at, it's a spiritual realm. Faint voices in Optimus's head call out to him, directing him towards a bright source of light. Optimus follows the light and finds himself in a gigantic metal arena with five raised podiums. Standing behind each podium is a noble and majestic Cybertronian. Optimus's eyes widen as he recognizes the Cybertronians as members of the 13 Primes. There's Alpha Trion, the records keeper of the Primes, whose duty is to chronicle the past, present, and future. There's Quintus Prime, the creator of the Space Bridge technology, and Vector Prime, the master of time and space. And then there's Mortillus Prime, who is responsible for ferrying the sparks of the dead into the afterlife. And lastly, the leader of the Thirteen, a proud warrior of light named Prima. Mortillus Prime reveals to Optimus that he is on the verge of dying, and that the spiritual realm they are in is actually the inside of the Allspark. Mortillus announces that he will replay all of the most critical moments in Optimus's life, and at the end of the examination, the five Primes will judge whether Optimus' spark is worthy to join with the Allspark or not. Mortillus Prime opens up a portal and beckons Optimus to step through with him. Optimus steals himself as he and his old comrade journey into the past together. We cut back to Autobot City. Over the base's intercom, all Autobot and Nest personnel are called to the garage. Expecting the worst, the Autobots solemnly march inside and stand alongside the rest of the assembled Nest agents. Bumblebee hides Spike inside his chest so that Marissa Fairborn, the director of Nest, doesn't catch Spike and throw him out. I liked the diversity that director Maring from Dark of the Moon brought to the cast through her strict and prudish behavior, and I wanted to keep that same diversity in this rewrite, but instead I wanted to replace director Maring with another character named Marissa Fairborn. She was an officer in Earth Defense Command back in the G1 show, who came from a military family. And since Nest is essentially Michael Bay's version of Earth Defense Command, it just seems like Fairborn would be the most natural pick as this rewrite's director of Nest. She's a tough, harsh, and let's face it, rude authority figure, but she's got a brave heart, and at the end of the day, she'll always choose to do the right thing, just like Maring from Dark of the Moon. Inside the garage, Ratchet and Wheeljack explain to the whole organization that Optimus' condition is critical, and the damages done to him were severely traumatizing. Thinking that all Optimus needs is some Energon, all the Autobots volunteer to donate their own Energon for their leader, but Ratchet explains that it's not that simple. The good news is that they were able to keep Optimus alive by placing him into emergency stasis, kind of like an induced coma. 
The bad news is, Optimus needs extensive surgery, and the Cybertronians aren't made of any metal that exists on Earth. They're made out of protomatter. The only source of protomatter in the galaxy is on Cybertron, and interstellar travel is currently unavailable for the Autobots, since the Exantium had been damaged when it landed on Earth. So, without access to the protomatter, there was no hope of repairing their beloved leader. The Allspark fixed my voice. Couldn't we repair Optimus with it? I'm afraid not. Under normal circumstances, yes. But for right now, no. Optimus's spark is still too weak to accept the Allspark's raw power. If he were to come into contact with it right now, there's a high probability that the artifact's energy will overwhelm his spark and kill him. We need to stabilize him before he can get anywhere near the Allspark. Otherwise, it'll do the very opposite of what we're trying to achieve. With no other options available to them, Ratchet suggests placing Optimus's succession to a vote. But before it can come to that, Chip pipes in with an idea. While it may be physically impossible to forge protomatter on Earth, there may be a composite metal that Chip and Wheeljack may be able to create by modifying some of Earth's rare metals and using them as a substitute for protomatter. Wheeljack stops and thinks for a moment. That might actually work, but we'll need a team to collect the metal. And an Autobot ground leader. Silence overtakes the room. Nobody wants to admit that Optimus is so close to death that one of them has to step up and take his place. Just the thought of losing him altogether is nerve-wracking. The Autobots cast glances at one another to see if any one of them are willing to accept the challenge. I'll do it. Ratchet steps forward. Are you sure, Bumblebee? I know I'm no leader, and I know I can never fill Optimus's place. But I can't just sit back and watch him go offline. Not when he's done so much for us. The Autobots all nod in agreement with B's words, accepting him as their new leader. We're going to need to move fast if there's going to be any hope for Optimus. Speed and stealth are our top priorities. We don't want to attract any unwanted attention that will slow us down. With that being said, Bumblebee picks out Blur, RC, and Mirage for his team. It's essential that Wheeljack and Chip go along too, so that they can properly extract the precious metals. Sideswipe and Sunstreaker ask if they can join the task group as well, and B agrees, but he sternly warns them against doing anything foolhardy, and for Optimus' sake, they need to obey his command by the T. The twins vow to cooperate with their new commander. But before they can move out, Director Fairborn stops Bumblebee and reminds him that a squad of nest agents will have to accompany his team. B insists that bringing extra humans along will only slow them down and prove to be more of a hindrance than anything else. But Fairborn isn't backing down, and she nags that as long as the Autobots live on Earth, they'll follow the Alien Autobot Cooperation Act that was signed by both Optimus and the rest of Earth's leaders. And the Alien Autobot Cooperation Act specifically states that the Autobots and Nest agents are to work hand in hand 100% of the time. That's why Nest exists in the first place, to serve as the perfect partnership between man and machine. B sighs with frustration and gives in, but he insists that only one human be assigned to one Autobot each to avoid carrying dead weight. Fairborn agrees, and Chip is assigned to Wheeljack, while Epps is with Bumblebee, Donnelly is with Blur, Burke with Mirage, and RC and the twins are partnered up with three new characters, a British agent named Davies, an African soldier named Zimmerman, and a female Chinese agent named Lang. This version of Nest is meant to be an international organization made up of elite soldiers from each of Earth's countries. In accordance with the Alien Autobot Cooperation Act, each world leader was obliged to pledge some of their best troops for Nest when they signed the treaty. So, Nest is comprised of special force troops from Africa, the UK, China, Australia, the US, and a number of other countries. I also did this because I felt like it would help add some diversity to the human cast as well. And this wraps up the end of Act 1. I combined the inciting incident with the climax of the first act, thereby knocking out two birds with one stone. The inciting incident will be the loss of Optimus Prime. The call to adventure, which in this version is the quest to rescue Optimus' soul, is taken up by Bumblebee, who will now serve as the main protagonist of our sequel. I thought it would be a nice change of pace in the Transformers saga to have an Autobot as the main character instead of a human. Spike will still be a major character, but he won't be the star of this show. If you like what you've seen so far, go ahead and show your support by liking this video and sharing it with your friends. In the next video, I'll be tackling the first half of Act 2 and how Bumblebee will handle the shift from being a team's cheerleader to being the actual leader. But in the meantime, let me know what you guys think of this rewrite so far, and I will see you guys when Part 2 comes out.